So growing up here in Tucson, Arizona, my favorite game was Flood. So I would go out into the sandbox and I would spend hours and hours building these elaborate cities of sand and then I'd turn on the hose and I would wipe it all out with a catastrophic flood. I can still remember the screams of all the imaginary people, please help me! And I, but don't worry, you know, no one was hurt because at just the last moment before their part of the crumbling city fell into the churning waters, well, I imagined lifting them all up to safety. And then when all was destroyed, well, then I'd, of course, rebuild and I'd do it again and again because I loved this game. But uh, I think it might have affected the water bill <laughs> because uh, it wasn't too long before I was banned from using hose water in the sandbox. Now, I was devastated at first, but then determined to find a different way. And I did, because I realized there was another water source, an ignored one, a free one, the rain. Because you see, we had this uh, dry uh, creek bed or arroyo in our front yard. And that thing was dry most of the year, but when there was a big rain, that thing would flow like a torrent. So I was like, all right, I'll build my sand cities anew in these dry creek beds. Then all I got to do is wait for rain. And I waited. <laughs> and waited. But eventually, the storm clouds built, and then when the rains came, the floods were epic. I mean, there was a volume of water that far exceeded anything you could get from a hose. It's like, oh yeah, I don't need no stinking hose. I got the rain. The flood is on again. I got pretty passionate about that. <laughs> and uh, while I no longer play the game of flood, that lesson of how much potential we have in the rain, that has never left me. And it continues to spark my work and play to this day. So here in the desert community of Tucson, Arizona, we only get 11 inches of rain a year. Yet, more rain falls on the surface area of Tucson in a year then all of Tucson and all its inhabitants consume of municipal water in a year. Do you get that? More rain falls on Tucson in a year than Tucson consumes of water a year. We already have all that we need, and it's delivered to us free of charge from the sky. But you wouldn't know it because we drain the vast majority of that right out of the system. So let's look at that. So in 1904, the uh, Santa Cruz River still flowed year-round through Tucson, Arizona. Not just after a big rain, but all year round. And we still had these sponge-like forests along the river that would absorb that rain and plant it in the living soils. Compare that to today, and due to over-pumping our groundwater, we have killed the river and the sponge-like forest that used to line it and help recharge it and the groundwater. And then we replace those sponges of vegetation with pavement of streets, buildings, and compacted bare earth, which leads to much more flooding because now the water runs off those hard surfaces much more quickly than it did before. And to replace all that rain that we drain, we then pump water 300 miles and 3,000 feet height and elevation from the Colorado River to Tucson and Phoenix at a cost of over $80 million a year and the death of the Colorado River's downstream stretch. Now, I hate this story because it's not unique to Tucson. I see it almost everywhere. We squander the natural abundance that we already have and we spend vast amounts of resources trying to replace that which we squandered by taking it from other people in other places, worsening scarcity for everyone. So what do we do? Well, it turns out that everywhere in the world that has a dry climate or even a wet climate with just a dry season has a rich history and traditions of investing, of harvesting the rain as opposed to draining it. Now, this was largely forgotten when we got mechanical pumps that could move water uphill. So I was pretty much unaware of the potential of harvesting rainwater uh, until I had the opportunity to travel to Africa and visit family and then explore on my own. And it was in the driest region of Zimbabwe that I got to meet the water farmer. 
Mr. Zephaniah Piri Maseko, who taught himself, then his family, and countless others, including myself, on how to harvest the rain. Or as he says, plant the rain. And he went down this path when many years ago he found himself struggling to support his family of eight with no job and no income. How was he to feed them? So he turned to the only two things he felt he had to get out of the situation, an eroding seven-acre parcel of land and the Bible, which he used as a gardening manual of sorts. Because you see, he was so inspired by the story of Genesis and the Garden of Eden that he got to thinking, well, I should grow such a garden and the water resources that will sustain it. Now, how do you go about doing that? Same way we all can, with long and thoughtful observation. So every time it rained, he'd be out there running, watching, seeing what was going on. And as he said, getting very wet, but being very happy. <laughs> because he was learning. And he saw the areas where things were not working, such as where the rain did not infiltrate the soil, but instead flowed off too quickly, causing erosion and downstream flooding. And he learned how to fix that by observing what was working, such as where there were rocks or vegetation perpendicular to the slope and the flow, slowing down, spreading out that flow, allowing sediment to drop out, moisture to linger, seeds to germinate, and vegetation to grow. So a living sponge started to form on what was previously a barren drain. So the creation of such living sponges, that's what it means to plant the rain. So Mr. Peary, he did this from the very top of his watershed in the beginning of the water flow all the way to the bottom of his land. Everywhere, slowing, spreading, and infiltrating the water. And by doing this, the, it was much more manageable. And he could move all the water with the free power of gravity. No pumps needed. Here, he would direct the runoff from this road to the adjoining basin lined with multi-use vegetation, turning this into this. And so once the water infiltrated into the soil, the soil was the tank, and water would be lost in much lower degree to evaporation. And then he could access the water from the tank of the soil through living pumps of vegetation and their fruit, their shelter, their livestock fodder, and more. And by doing this, even in a drought year, the Peary's were able to get two to three harvests from their crops. When others not planting the rain were lucky to get just one. And they could also access the rain they planted in the form of their rising groundwater, which created seasonal springs and filled their hand dug wells. And the rain the Peary's planted, it also filled the wells of their adjoining and downstream neighbors. And so the planting of rain started to catch on because people saw that there were others in the community whose wells went dry when they weren't planting the rain. Why the difference? Well, the difference is those without, whose wells were drying, they just kept taking water but never gave back, whereas the Peary's made sure they kept putting more back into the system than they took out. So it caught on, and I got to visit dozens of other farmers inspired or taught by the Peary's who had likewise converted dying drains to vital sponges. And I was so inspired by this that I told Mr. Peary about how freaked out I was about the water situation in my community and how I no longer wanted to contribute to the depleting waters by consuming those depleting waters. And I wanted to leave and ask him for his advice. To which point, he slapped me on the shoulder and he said, well, you cannot leave. Because if you run from your problems, you're just going to plant and grow problems everywhere you go. So you've got to try and figure out how to turn those problems into solutions. And if you succeed at that, well, you'll have the ability to do that wherever you find yourself. Now that challenge, that resonated to my core. And I knew that this was a challenge that could be met because I'd seen it in the example the Peary's lived and those that they had inspired. I just had to figure out how to tweak things to fit the unique conditions and context of my home. So I returned home to this, a dry, degraded eighth of an acre property that my brother and I had just purchased north of downtown Tucson. And how did we begin? Well, the same as the Peary's, with observation. So in the first big rain, we were out there running and watching, seeing what was going on. And we were losing so much water to the street 
But worse, plenty more water was flowing into the house. I, mean, I was the victim of my childhood game of flood. So my brother and I are like, man, we got to turn the game around, man. Turn flood into harvest. So we did that. We, we diverted the water away from the house into these sponge-like uh, basins and, with mulch and vegetation, and th- which would rapidly absorb it. And then in times of no rain, we redirected our household gray water, that once used wash water from the showers, laundry, or sinks, to the landscape, turning that wastewater into another free resource water. And this way, we found that all we needed to grow the vegetation that would shade shelter and beautify the house was the water draining from the house. And this enabled us to break a needless addiction, ubiquitous across the US. So it turns out that the average single family household in the US consumes 30 to 50% of its drinking water to irrigate their landscape. This is what happens when we use hose water or drip irrigation water to replace the rainwater we wastefully drain away. So we don't do that. Instead, we plant food-bearing, native, and climate-appropriate plants that can thrive just on our harvested rainwater and gray water. And we don't throw away or vacuum our leaves. (laughs) Leaves are called leaves because we're supposed to leave them. (laughs) So we harvest them along with cut up prunings in our water harvesting basins, creating these fertile sponges of mulch which rapidly absorb the water so we don't lose it to evaporation and nor do we have puddles or mosquitoes. And we don't have flooding either because we make sure we always have an overflow route should there be a massive storm that exceeds what we can hold and infiltrate. And even that overflow water is used as a resource because we direct that to multiple downstream strategies. So in eight years, we're able to turn this into this. And no drinking water is used. No city water, no imported water, no well water. Only rainwater and the runoff from the pathways in the street. And because we planted so many native plants, many, uh, or dozens of native bird species have returned, and pollinators. And the shade from the trees has dropped summer temperatures by 10 degrees, dropping the cooling costs of adjoining homes as well. And it's caught on to such a degree, with many more neighbors doing this, that we now have many people walking and bicycling through, which has dropped crime, because now there's more friendly eyes on the street. And within the street, we notice that the street gutter would flow like a creek in a big rain. So we cut the street gutter to direct the street runoff to street side basins. Now this was illegal at the time, (laughs) okay? So we cut the curb on a Sunday when no one from the city was watching, okay? But the results were amazing. Because we found that every street everywhere can be a shaded corridor of native food trees and other life irrigated with nothing more than the rain falling on the street, controlling flooding at the same time. So we went to the city to legalize and enhance the practice. And then we got it incentivized. And now it's even mandated in new city road construction and renovation. And this this advocacy work is key. This advocacy work to change practice, policy, and law. Because without a will, there is no way. So to further spark that will, I wrote and published how-to books, did countless talks, and with others did workshops. And we organized annual rain and tree planting projects in our neighborhood and others. And in our neighborhood alone, Since 1996, we have planted over 1,400 native food-bearing trees. And we harvest over a million gallons of rain each year that previously ran out of the neighborhood. But this is just the start. I mean, we can and need to harvest tens of millions of gallons more just in that neighborhood. And billions of gallons more throughout the community. So you don't have to be a homeowner to do this, or even have a yard. 
Because most of the planting we do is in the public arena, along the street or in the street, the commons, such as here with a water harvesting traffic calming roundabout, or here, a water harvesting traffic calming chicane. But you can do it on school grounds, church grounds. You can even do it in parking lots and parks. And you can do it in all climates, wet and dry, because it mitigates extremes. It reduces flooding and wet times. It reduces drought and dry times. The only thing that changes as you shift work from one climate to the other is the plants that you use. And you can do it on all scales. When you start to harvest rainwater and experience that in your landscape, that leads to harvesting rainwater for washing, for cooking, for drinking. Sponge neighborhoods lead to sponge cities. Revived creeks lead to revived rivers. So what, sponge, or what drains do you have in your life that you could turn into sponges? The work is easy. What's difficult is the shift in thinking. Because planting the rain is a 180 degree shift from how we typically do things today. It's about shifting from a scarcity mindset to abundance. It's about using what you already have not what you buy or import. It's about partnering with natural systems, not fighting them. It's about growing more life and potential, not paving over it. And as soon as you do this, as soon as you experience it in the rain, you immediately see how it all works. It all makes sense. You see how you're a key part of a solution and not a problem. But this comes with a serious risk. Because even if it's 3 a.m. and it starts to rain, you're likely to run outside in your underwear just to see your basins and tanks fill up with water. And when you see all that accumulating abundance, you're going to take these here buns and do a little bun dance on the path to a bun dance. And you see it all happen and you're going to shout, I don't need no stinking hose. I got the rain. The harvest is on. <laughs> 